Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of BSD Synergy. I'm your host, Mason Egger, and this week's episode will be the power of PF. So, I bet a lot of you noticed, or however many of you watched last week's episode, that I said there was going to be an episode last week, and there wasn't. Uh, guess Code Freeze didn't really turn out the way it was supposed to. So, I'm just going to stick with the two-week schedule for now, for a very long time, likely. Um, between work and potentially starting grad school soon. It's just going to make my life a little bit easier and it'll give me more time to at least plan out some of these videos. So I was going to do a BSD router this week, but of course, shiny object caught my eye and now I'm not doing that. So I realized that trying to just jam pack everything about a BSD router into one video was going to make the video really long and people probably weren't likely to watch it. So I'm going to cover the parts of the router. Mostly this time I'm going to cover uh, PF and then I'll probably cover the router. I don't need to cover like the DNS and the DHCP servers and stuff. I can cover that in the video, but PF is such a large part and it deserves its own video. So what is PF? PF is OpenBSD's firewall. Um, it was ported to FreeBSD and it is the power behind PFSense. If you have a PFSense box, you are using PF, but you're using the FreeBSD version. Um, the two code bases have diverged, uh, mostly I think due to kernel support issues. So there are things that exist in OpenBSD's PF and FreeBSD's PF that are different. Uh, they're different products now. Um, it, it should note that FreeBSD, uh, the default firewall is not PF, it's IPFW. With OpenBSD, PF is installed by default. If you want PF on FreeBSD, you do have to install it. So today we're going to be talking exclusively about OpenBSD's PF and some of the just the bare bones basic things you need to know about PF. Okay, so I'm basically just going to go over in quick detail um, the PF user guide from openbsd.org slash FAQ slash PF. If you want to read more of this or you want to be able to see more of it, then feel free to go to this website. You'll, there's a lot that I'm not going to be able to cover in this short video, but I'm going to try to get to most of it. And I am... going to make it bigger for people to be able to read on the video. So first thing uh, we need to talk about really is the lists and macros. So PF supports a list style system where these are the where you see these uh, curly braces they're actually being interpreted on runtime and creating the rules on runtime. So instead of having to, if I wanted you know to open you know block out from five IP addresses, instead of having to write five rules, I could just write this, add the five IP addresses to the list, and the rules will get generated at runtime, which is pretty much useful. And you can do multiple lists inside of it. Uh, you know, this is TCP UDP from these two to these ports. So um, you do have that. You have the macros. If you notice here, you have 22 and 80, and then you have SSH and, you know, tell me that's not 80, but you have the option of using, you know, the common... Uh, I think these are like these are like Cisco uh, Cisco based uh, macros. SSH is obviously twenty two. Um, personally, for me, I always use port numbers uh, and usually leave comments in my PF file if I'm using like a non standard port. You know, like if I'm doing something weird like SNMP or something. Um, so those, there's that, and that's pretty much lists. The other thing is macros, and macros are basically variables inside your file. Um, very highly recommended to use macros, especially for interface naming, because you know you might be using EM0 today, but tomorrow you want to use EM1, and changing it in one place beats changing it in the entire file. Even though we do have that magical you know Vim search and replace, it's still nice to be able to just do the variable that way. So macros, variables. Pretty straightforward. Basically, you just give it a name equals and you put it in quotes. And FXP0 is actually the name of the interface. And then whenever you want to use it, you just use a dollar sign in the name of the macro and it interprets it for you. The other really good thing are tables. So you can actually create tables of, uh, of IP addresses or even subnet masks. You know, or, or not, sorry, not subnet masks, networks of CIDR, CIDR defined networks and then you can write rules based on these tables so basically you know this example right here has good guys rfc 1918 i usually don't do these two i usually do do a spammers or a brute force or assholes sometimes it's called assholes um and basically i want to block in from you know these people and i have that table um and the cool thing is is you can actually have this table in a file. So basically what you would do is you have table spammers persist in a file called slash Etsy spammers. 
and then you would block that and then whenever you run pf this would have to be up closer to the top whenever or pretty much it should be the first thing in your file i mean it should be one of the first things in your pf config pf dot con, con f um it would load it from the file and you've got your rule set and you don't have to worry about these people anymore which is a really good thing um if you want to manually add people to it and you don't even have to use etsy spammers file wherever but if you say you want to manually add an asshole you know pfctl dash t spammers dash uppercase t add you know ip address yeah uh, you can show you can delete somebody totally up to you and this is how you would match it you know table block in and then pass in from that now the largest section of this guide and probably one of the more complex is the uh is the packet filtering is the actual firewall part you would expect you know blocking of things itself um i personally like pf the best i think it's one of the most straightforward and simple uh firewall syntaxes i've ever had to deal with you know this is this is a great uh description of it action you know the direction log quick on interface af proto protocol from source ADR, addr port source port to destination address from the port or port de destination port flags with your tcp flags state uh it does it is a stateful firewall it will keep state it will monitor and track state for you if you ask it to um so yeah it's got a lot of cool things and it tells you basically all the stuff you want uh af address family um i couldn't remember that one off the top of my head when i was talking about it so you can do ports you can do a range of ports you can say i don't want anything less than you know this or greater than that and Lots of cool things. State, you can keep the state, you can modulate the state, no state, really cool stuff. Um, so the default deny is a big part of how the firewall works. PF is actually a last match firewall, which I think if, and I, I don't know off the top of my head because I don't know IP tables, I think it's that's a contrast to IP tables because I think IP tables is a first match. So basically the last match in your rule set is the match that will hit. So typically, the thing you will do at the very beginning is block all. So block all will be at the very top after you load your tables and stuff. And then what happens is all your rules will be processed. If none of those rules are processed, the block all will be the one that hits. So there's that. Yes. And then it does, it says here, traffic must be explicitly passed through the firewall or it will be dropped by default. It's a default block, basically, uh, at least the way we set it up. And that's typically the best way to set up a firewall, in my opinion, is a default block, not a default allow and block those who are coming in. Block everybody and I will explicitly grant you permission into my, into my land, into my life. Um, so you would pass in from the network to the router if you needed to, or gateway, that would probably be the gateway. Now there's quick. Quick is kind of the way to get around some of this. If you don't want the rules to be the last set, so say you have you have the ability to so quick is the way to kind of write contradictory rules. So say you have a rule up here and a rule down here that they could both be applied, but you know it maybe if this condition, you know you only you want this one replied, or maybe this IP address only, but you don't want this to happen. So what you would do is you would write the quick keyword. So the quick keyword basically stops all rule processing, and once it if it if it matches that rule, that's it. Nothing else will happen. So quick is the way. If you have some weird exception or something that you need to be able to handle, well then you would you know block quick on that one. Um, this really kind of you know this is this is I, I see a better example of this if you're passing in all and then you want to block somebody quickly. Um, because if you don't block it quickly and it matches, but it keeps going, remember last match is the rule. So if you, if you wrote like block in on something and then like, right, basically what's going on right here, uh, block in quick, but then pass on or block in on all, you know, this would not, this would, this is wrong right here. This would not actually block because last rule wins in PF. So you would block in quick and then pass in all. Um, I'm trying to think of a better example of it, but I can't right now because, or a better example with a block all structure. I don't do pass in all um so the other really cool thing is uh pf can keep the state of your firewall it can keep the state of the packets uh for both tcp and it it, it can in a way do udp and i know people are going what do you mean it keeps state for udp eh, eh. basically what it does is it keeps track of start uh in case of protocols without start and end packets pf simply tracks how long it has been since a machine Matching packet has gone through, and if the timeout has reached, the state is cleared. 
So there's lots of stateful tracking and all this stuff, but the really cool thing about state is this is the thing, state really allows us to actually ban people from our network. So in my previous video, I had mentioned that you need, you would have to use something like uh, fail to ban and somebody commented and said, no, you didn't. And I don't know why I didn't remember this because I ran an open BSD router at my apartment for, oh shoot, I lived there three and a half years. Um, probably three years because there was a massive hard drive failure. It still makes me sad. Um, that killed that killed my virtual host that had it, and that's why I have a free now server now. Um, but you can actually ban people with PF. So one of the things you would want to do is basically is it's this rule right here. So you have this table abusive hosts, and then you're gonna block these people. But you're gonna but then you could pass in. And basically, flags is keeping the state, send, send, act, send, checking the proxy for send, act, keep state, uh, max source connection, mass source con rate, 15.5. Okay, so basically what this is saying is there can be 100 connections. Uh, the max connection rate is 15 per 5 seconds. And if this is abused, if we get 20 in 5 seconds, 20 in 2 seconds from the same IP address, it's going to overload the abusive host's table. It will add it in there, and then, the, and then the flush will actually kill any other states that match this rule and that were created by this source AP. So it, it, if there's established connections and it hits its timeout, everybody gets killed. Everybody's flushed out, and that connection has been deemed abusive. Now... One of the things that I used to do is I had a cron job that would actually flush the state of the table to the file and I would load the file on reboot. So basically every like hour or so, uh, I would actually take, I would use the cron, the cron job to see all the blocked people in this table and flush it out to the file that actually gets read on, uh, on, on reboot. So basically what would happen is somebody would get banned and then after an hour they would get added to the file for permanent ban and then whenever if the machine did reboot which it didn't reboot often but power failures and idiot roommates tripping over power cables is, is a thing um and if it did get whenever it came back it would read that from the file and from the file it would get all the people had banned so there was kind of like an hours uh you know if you if, if you were attacking me and then 59 minutes later the power went out of my apartment congratulations you didn't get in um you can always set your cron job to more but honestly i didn't I don't even mind if even set it to once a day because like the power they were just they, if they were going to continue to abuse me they were going to get banned again and you really don't want to spend all your time like you're doing a cron job flushing it especially whenever uh, as we talked last week I have so little resources for this machine to actually have um so I didn't really bother with it that much. Another thing you would do is if you want these people to only be banned for a certain amount of time, you can cron to clear them after a certain amount of time. Do all sorts of cool things with cron. Um, I actually never did that. My ban at my apartment was a permanent ban. If you were caught banging up against my firewall and I you displeased me, I banned you for life. So this does lead to issues of I'm not home trying to get in and either forgot the password or something's being dumb. And I get myself kicked out, and I really can't get back in until I get home, and I can actually log in to the router and clear myself from the state file. So, there's that. And then for everybody, TCP flags and ACK, woohoo. You can do all these other cool things. Blogging spoofed packets with, you know, your anti-spoof. Uh, unicast, passive operating system fingerprinting. There is a lot of really cool stuff that PF can do. Not really going to cover much more of this because we don't really need it for a basic router. So the next thing that's really important is our NAT. We have to be able to NAT in and out. Um, you are going to have to set some sysctl variables. You're going to have to set IPv forwarding and IP6 forwarding if you're planning on using IPv6. Our demo, demo next in the next two weeks is not going to have IPv6. Um, so I'm not going to set that sysctl variable. But you do have to do use that one. So if you want to NAT out, these are a good example of some NAT rules. I already have the NAT rules written, so you'll see them next week. Um, and you can do bidirectional mapping. You can check the NAT status uh, on there. So yeah, it's pretty cool. NAT2 is the uh, keyword you need for that. Traffic redirection is another really good one to know. Um, 
You can redirect any traffic. So say I want to add SSH and I want to be able to get into my dev box through the router. So basically I would just pass in f from any and then I would just redirect to uh, to the IP address that I want to go to. If you don't specify the port, it will automatically take the port that's set. You can actually redirect port to uh, like, you know, IP address to port. So if you wanted, you know, you had SSH on your dev box like 2200 or something, you could, you know, just redirect the port. Still SSH on 22 on the router, but then to 20. Or, you know, that's probably not the best example. The best example would be, you know, you don't want 22 open because it's a, it's a known port. Mindless bots will hit it. So random port on the outside, but redirect to 22 on the inside is probably a better decision. Um, you can even RDR, you can redirect on a port range. Um, security implications, it's the funny they have that they're, you know, punching holes in a firewall, you're opening yourself up. That's just something you gotta know. Uh, redirection and reflection, you can do split horizon DNS, all sorts of cool things to make this better. Um, not really gonna, the shortcuts for rules, basically macros. <laughs> um... The other cool thing that I want to go over is the ability to tag your packets. So you can actually tag a packet to things inside of your um, inside your network, and these are your internal network tags. And this will help you later, you know, if you want to tag it out. The packet can even have a tag last matching rule. Eh. They're internal identifiers; they're not sent out. So if you need, for a reason, to be able to tag something in your network specific to you. I do like a tag allowed that allows things back out. So basically if something comes, if something is trying to come in, it needed it, the, this old state would have to be tagged allowed from like, so it have to have gone out and then be allowed back in. Uh, it doesn't just allow anybody back in and you'll see this all next week. I'll go over the tagging a little bit more in detail next week. Whenever we go over the actual PF um, thing that I have, the PF, uh, PF conf that I have, but yeah, so yeah, that's pretty much PF in a nutshell. So thank you for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you're looking forward to the episode in the next two weeks. If you like the video, go ahead and leave me a like. If you want to comment, go ahead and leave me a comment. And remember, you can email me. You can support the channel by donating to the uh, PayPal. You can do whatever you like. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next week.